This is GDB Channel 9. The time is Trail, the original GTV9 news theme that introduced this famous man to our screens every night at 6.30. Sir Eric Pierce, good evening. Good evening. How are you? That would bring back memories for you, Eric. It certainly did, Philip. And uh, it stirs my mind quite a bit when I, when I hear that. Yes, well, I was just, uh, in recent weeks, I've told Bruce about those wonderful days we used to have in Studio 2 at Channel 9 where uh, Jim Berenson would be in one corner of the studio uh, for Western Theatre with his 4 and 20 pies and <laughs> Professor Brown would be in another corner and there you'd be at your news desk, the doyen of Australian newsreaders. There's never been anybody to touch you, Eric. Oh, come, come, come. You're making me blush. <laughs> well, it, it, it is the truth. Uh, kind of you. But I feel, uh, oh, well, yes, but, uh, you know, w once again, just to uh, give you a cliche, um, and I, I don't know how else to avoid, uh, to say it, at least, um, it, was, it was not a solo job, as you very well know. We never, we, we take praise because we're the front men. You yourself must have experienced that over and over again. But we'd never be doing anything unless we had the whole team around us. Cameras and crew and the whole lot of them. I'll never forget, uh, Eric, when I was at uh, Myers spruiking on the microphone. You were uh, you were a regular visitor to the fourth floor menswear department. I often see you walking through there. Yes. And I was doing some work on the microphone, and you said to a supervisor or manager of the shirt department, "My word, that young fellow on the on the on the mic has got a good voice. He'll go places." And it got back to me, and I was as proud as punch. <laughs> You old leg puller. Is it Bruce? No, <laughs> yeah, it, no but it's true. Oh. <laughs> well, Eric, there are, there are many sides to you because you, uh, at Channel 9 in those early days, you compared uh, the highly successful Thursday at one show. You were always... Uh, Gotten that. Yes, that's true. And then you'd, you'd produce the violin for Graham Kennedy's in Melbourne tonight and, <laughs> and occasionally play April showers. And, of course, you were always... You were always the anchor man of all those wonderful telethons we did for you, Rally, through the years. That's right. Yes, yes, I was, and I was very proud of that, and uh, I was very proud too of, of uh, the work all of us did for you, Rally, but with the results uh, which were magnificent. Eric, did it all begin at the BBC in London for you? Well, I caught the bug, I suppose, uh, it's fair to say that. I caught the bug for extending my personality, being a show-off, in other words, I think it was, either with my voice or my body, and I was no good at dancing. So, uh, yes, I tried to get into the BBC, but unfortunately, due to my father's death, uh, when I was uh, on about 17 years of age, I could not proceed with... Uh, what I badly wanted to do in life, and that's to become a lawyer. I couldn't go to, therefore I couldn't go to university because of my father's death. And in those days at the BBC, you needed a university education. So what I did was to write and say, well, will you at least give me an audition? And they did. And they said, well, we should let you know. And to my uh, great joy, in about a couple of weeks' time after that, I was then staying with some friends at a little place called Sandersted, um, near Croydon. I don't know, do you know London? Um, not, not very well, though. No, well, anyhow, it doesn't matter where it is. Um, and uh, the letter came and said, yes, will you please present yourself an audition to... Uh, I think I'm right in saying that it was at the Savoy, opposite the Savoy Hotel. Yes. It wasn't Broadcast House, because I don't know that that was, um, that they were in that at that time. But in any event, wherever it was, um, I managed to get the job off 
relief uh, newsreader. And uh, believe it or not, for those first two or three weeks or months, um, I had to wear a dinner jacket to wear the, to read the news. <laughs> and, and we're talking, of course, early radio. We're not talking television. Oh, that's right. Yes. Oh, this is radio at all, yes. So, so the purpose of the dinner suit was to sort of get you into the mood, was it? To sort of create that formal atmosphere for news reading on radio? Well, everybody did it. It wasn't, wasn't only the news reader. No, no every, everyone who appeared on... Uh, uh, everyone who appeared on the screen, I was going to say. But everyone who fronted up to the microphone, whatever he did, had to wear a dinner jacket. I think the trend followed, too, at the ABC here in Australia, Eric. I think it did for a time. Hmm. So let's... You can imagine the boys, but, you know, of today... Well, you know, some of them, some of the newsreaders of today, no names, no pactual, they'll come into the studio at weekends wearing jeans or shorts. Thanks. Can you imagine it? Yes, I've been against that all my life. I hate that kind of thing, uh, particularly when uh, outsiders may, might pop in and see it. destroys all the... Um, what's the word I want, you know? You'll have to supply me the few words. My my um, memory and my recall isn't... Well, I suppose it destroys the image, doesn't it? The charisma. So that's, that's the way to put it. So, Eric, let's leave London and your journey to Australia. You arrived... Was it Adelaide, your first port of call? No, no, no. I arrived in Sydney to a job with AWA... <coughs> Bigger pardon, um, AWA or an AWA owned station, 2CH. I had a letter from a friend of my father's to the uh, chairman of the ABC, and I met in the hotel at which I was then staying. I don't think it's there in Sydney any longer. I met Coleman, not, um, I think, it was Eric, Eric Coleman. He was the brother of Ronald Coleman, wasn't he? He was the ABC. Yes. Uh, I was in the bar, I must confess, and uh, I asked the barman for a beer because it was very hot. It was February, if I remember rightly, 1938. And uh, I've had a, an, an accent you could cut with a knife in those days, an English accent. <laughs> this voice um, I heard, and I turned around and looked. The voice said, I say... You come from the old Dart or whatever he said. And uh, I said, yes. He said, well, you get here. And I told him. And then, he, then we had a conversation. <laughs> I beg your pardon. I've coughed. And um, he said, well, if you don't mind me saying so, you think I've got an awful cheek, but I think you'd be, a, you'd, you'd be very much better um, getting into commercial television, uh, commercial radio at least. Because um, they won't pay, pay you anything at the uh, ABC, and you'll find they're a little difficult to get along with too. He was with the ABC at the time I might mention. So, um, all right, um, he suggested me that I go for an audition to um, what's the difference his name Claude Fleming. Who was an, old, an, an actor, an English actor, who was out here and who was then studio manager of 2CH in uh, Sydney. That was a, a station which AWA had, the, I think they had the license and rented it out to a, a church, hence the CH. I don't know what church, but. And uh, I had the audition and uh, managed to get the job of announcer. I became uh, chief announcer, and uh, as was the case in those days, what little news there was was fed from uh, the ABC. So uh, there's no news reading. So the move to Melbourne, uh, Eric, and... Oh, yes. Yes, uh, we'll, we've moved to Melbourne, and your job was at 3DB, was it, first up? No, it wasn't. It was at 3XY. Mm -hmm. I came to... Um, I applied for, or answered... Um, I, think, I think I'm right. I'm sorry. I don't want to mislead you, but I think it was right that I answered an advertisement in the, in a paper um, after I'd been with 2CH for about uh, oh, a year or a year and a half or something. And uh, I was then married, by the way, my first wife. 
and uh, I uh, got uh, I was asked to come down to Melbourne for an audition and I did I went down there and I had an audition and uh, I got a job with the three XY studio manager and chief announcer and uh, that was a happy time. Eric, what prompted you to come to Australia in the first place when things were perhaps going so well for you at the BBC? It was it was quite a risk, wasn't it? Well, I wasn't prepared to just do uh, casual work on the BBC. That was the that was the thing I didn't like very much. Well, it was quite a job, but it didn't pay very much for a start. I think it was about 30 shillings a week or something like that. Not a night, a week. Yes. <laughs> well, this new medium, television, coming along, uh, did you have an inkling that you wanted to go on, or how did how did the break come for you there? Well, then I was with the, after after three weeks where I went to uh, went into the air force. I was with uh, in the air force, um, serving in the air force for about two years, I think, and I was in the lead Iraq. Uh, then I came, when I came back, I went to 3DV as studio manager and chief announcer. And that's when I really started news reading in earnest. Um, right, now we get to television. And uh, whilst I was at uh, 3DB, oh no, I'm sorry, uh, I then went to Adelaide and became general manager. Job I applied for, general manager of... Uh, 5KA in Adelaide, 5KA, 5RM and 5AU, and I had four, nearly five years there. And then, that brings us up to 1955, I think I'm right in saying, or it might be 54, um, but, but then they suggested that um, the uh, Herald people suggested that I might like to go back uh, to the Herald, have a holding job as uh, within the major network as program director in Sydney, and then uh, start with HSV7. So with much regret at leaving, the one thing that um, persuaded me to do that, incidentally, was the fact that my first wife, Jean, was very ill, and had to have something that could not be done in Adelaide, had a, a treatment that couldn't be done in Adelaide. So um, I decided to go to Sydney. We went, she couldn't travel in any other way than by ship, so we went on a coastal ship and uh, to Adelaide. But I regret to say that she died not very long afterwards. Oh, oh that's very sad. Um, uh, anyhow, I, I then uh, got to Sydney and uh, was uh, had an office at 2UE, which was then uh, the key station of the major network. And I used to look after programs and things for the network in those days. When I say network, it really wasn't a network as we know it now, but uh, it was quite a few stations hooked up. Eric, why did you make the transition very early on from Channel 7 to Channel 9? That made headlines everywhere. <laughs> well, uh, all this story, was, <laughs> as I'm uh, talking to you, seems as though I've done nothing else but jump around <laughs> yeah. quite a bit. No, that's probably our fault. That's probably because of the line of questioning. I can say yes. I'm not filling it in properly. Of course you are. It's wonderful. There were very good reasons for me doing everything I've done <laughs> at the moment. And I thank God very sincerely that it's all turned out all right. Well, to answer your question, I got fed up with doing everything. I was reading news. I was comparing um, quizzes and things. Now, I didn't mind that for kick-off. But it continued for month after month. And, uh, I mean, my day used to consist of coming in, rehearsing for, say, um, um, oh, I, I forget, a quiz show of some sort, say. Uh, then I played with Mary um, Parker. She was the weather girl, wasn't she? That's right. And she came from the BBC, of course. Yes. And uh, um, Mary played the piano. And I used to sing, 
um, with Mary. Uh, what else did I do? Oh, a few other things, and do ordinary announcements and so on, and commercials, and then read the news. And I thought that's entirely wrong. It's uh, it's ruining the whole um, the whole. Um, What's the word again, Philip or, or Bruce? What's the word I want? You know, the, the the news must be seen to be real, credible. Yes, that's right. Yes, credibility. That's the word I wanted. It ruined the whole credibility, in my opinion, of the news service. So I was then uh, restless. I went to John Williams, Sir John, as he was told him that I was unhappy. And without further ado, he turned his back, I can see it now, in his office, went straight over to the telephone, or if he didn't, he went and looked out of the window while I'd finished talking to him, kind of thing, ignoring me, <laughs> then came back, picked up the telephone, and uh, rang um, the devil brother, Jim Cairns, who was then manager. He was, um, you know, fellow was writer on, on the Herald. Yes. And uh, he was manager of HSV. Who was that? Keith Cairns, yes. Oh, Keith. What is it? What's it, did you say? Well, am I right? Yes. Well, sorry. All right. Well, it was Keith. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, he said, uh, will you see that um, Pierce uh, doesn't go on tonight? He's not very happy, so don't let him go on. And uh, I'll... Uh, get in touch with the, or you can, he said, get, I remember this, you can get in touch with the cashier. And that was that. <laughs> Subsequently, we made it all up, you know, in about a month or two afterwards, at somebody's funeral, I think it was, one of the Herald people's funeral, and, uh, and uh, we shook hands, and we each forgave one another. But uh, that, uh, that, however, then I, I got the job at, um, Channel 9, um, Colin Bednall, when I went to see him, he was the general manager there, or managing, no, general manager he was, I tried, that's what they called them then, and uh, he was, put his hand over his face and said, well, yes, all right, I don't like taking anyone, uh, it'll be so public. Oh, Norman Spencer, too, was the first one I saw, but I went spend time on that. I'll just jump the hurdles. Uh, and he said, well, uh, you know, I don't like publicly doing this. Uh, we've got an agreement that we won't pinch each other's um, stuff. Yes. So uh, I said, well, will you let me know definitely, or will Norman let me know definitely? And uh, he said, oh, yes. And they cooked up something for me to be paid by an agency. I was to be their newsreader, and uh, uh, my pay would go through an agency. I'd be employed by Fortune. That's who. It, that's who it was. Fortune Advertising Agency. Rather than be on the Channel Nine payroll, yes. <laughs> and of course, Sir Eric, the rest is history. <laughs> so it didn't last very long, but uh, I mean, the, you know, the the. the um, I was on their payroll very soon after that. Well, we've covered a lot of ground with you uh, tonight, Sir Eric, and... Uh, I'm exceptionally sorry that I'm not more... Uh, uh, you've... I can't cope with it. But you've been wonderful tonight. You are very fluent. And it's been a real treat. I know that you don't give these interviews, and we're so proud that uh, you've deemed us uh, one tonight. I did it because I, I like both of you very much indeed. In fact, I have a very warm affection for you both. You both, I've worked with both of you, and I admire your skills, your professional skills, and your disciplines. Well, let's just say that that maybe you, for Phil and myself, have been a bit of a, a role model, uh, Sir Eric. Right. Well, I'm, that's very nice to hear. Thank you. And on another occasion, I think I think we should cover the last 35 years from, from you joining Channel 9 in 1957. And perhaps I didn't want to keep you too late tonight, as we assured you we wouldn't, but perhaps we'll continue this on another occasion, Sir Eric. I think it be... My, I mean, I'd be very happy to do it. I think it's a good idea to cut it, though, a bit, because...
because uh, it, people might get bored. Uh, I'm not suggesting they. Uh, you're too modest. There's no doubt that they they wouldn't. Uh, but I would love you to sign off oh, right. the interview as you did for all those years on Channel Nine News. I shall. Well, now this is it, Pierce. Saying to you two friends and to everyone who's uh, listening, thank you for having me, and God bless you and you. <laughs>